Hello, possums. Dreamer here, Hardcore Castle. I am back. My voice is back. It's still a little rough. I apologise for that. But just because I've been sick doesn't mean I haven't been busy. I've been doing lots of things. As you can see, oh, I hate doing this. The little wood that was between the work camp and the village, that's gone. I've done other things too, which we'll have a look at in a minute. But oh, the main thing that's taken my time... <laughs> I'm going to run down to the guild hall. I'll meet you there. So here we are. I have started putting in a couple of workstations for other professions. But this is the guild of bookmakers. So if we come upstairs... Oh, there's our guild master wandering around. Oh. How can they bind to more than one... Oh, yeah, that's our guild master. This guy has just randomly bound to a lectern that's already got someone bound to it, so I don't quite get how that works. But I have got essentially a Minecraft village, a trading hall here for enchanted books. Not all the books, just the ones I want. Some of them are at their cheapest, some are not, but if they aren't, they're only one or at maximum two emeralds out. I've got everything I need, and we have... An apprentice here who hasn't worked out who he is yet and what he wants to do. But the guild master and I will deal with him. He's signed up. He's raring to go. And if we come through to the guild tavern, we have a guild tavern keep. He's got a jaunty little hat. He's got a little apron. And he's got some rags on his tunic. We'll ignore the fact that they look like a fish. That's just a coincidence. So this... Took an inordinate amount of time. If we have a look at my stats, there we are, 6,469 mined. That's the number of times I've picked up a lectern because it hasn't been the right one. That took a while. And that's only for 18 of these guys. <laughs> uh. So anyway, I have been busy with other things and... I think probably the best way to show you those is an overhead view. Although I will do this. Now I have put in a wall around the church. I have got more gaps in it than you'd probably have because villagers, ease of egress, let's just do it. But what I've got here is a lich gate. Now lich is just the Anglo-Saxon word for body. It's the gate through which the dead bodies were brought to be buried. And when I told my son what this is, he went, oh, so the supernatural being the lich, it's just the body, that sort of loses something. So, yeah, it does. Wow, lich lord, you're the body lord. Woot. So I'm going to roll the replay footage and I'm going to talk to you about medieval relics. Our little church doesn't have any saints relics yet but they will be on the lookout for them. The 12th and 13th centuries were a great time for relics and relic hunters and churches competed for relics of popular saints. Why? Because relics meant pilgrims and pilgrims meant money. Pilgrims travelled usually by walking to a site of spiritual significance or that housed a relic of their chosen saint as a sign of devotion or as penance for a sin, to seek healing, to give thanks for healing or for whatever reason. And when they arrived, they needed food and accommodation and maybe a souvenir to commemorate their visit, such as a badge or ampule, and all those things required money. Pilgrims were the medieval tourists. So it was beneficial to a church to have a saint's relic. And relics could be anything. Body parts were really popular, but it could also be clothing, tears, possessions anything. There was a roaring trade in relics, both genuine and fake. Local saints were great, and you could generally be fairly certain that your relics were real, especially if you could trace exactly what had happened to them from the time of the saint's death, pre-sanctification, through to the beginning of their veneration. I'll put a link in the description to the Time Team video about Saint Ian Swither. That's well worth a squeeze and is an interesting look at the fate of relics over the centuries, particularly with the advent of Henry VIII. 
but churches also looked to the superstar saints that could bring you pilgrims from all over. And that's where the frauds and fakers stepped in and could really make a killing. There are enough pieces of the true cross to make a good sized boat. And it's a wonder Mary Magdalene could lift her head the amount of hair that seems to be around. I'm not saying they're all fake, but I am saying there is a suspicious amount of both relic types. My favourite fake relic is in a monastery in Italy. They have held since medieval times the head of John the Baptist as a child. I love that. <laughs> as well as relic fakers, there were relic hunters and there was also a lively relic trade. And my favourite tale of a combination of these comes from the 12th century. I came across this when I was at uni and I sat in the library of Sydney University with my fist stuffed in my mouth to stop myself from hooting with laughter. It concerns Hugh of Lincoln. Now, Hugh was an amazing man and well worth finding out about. Go and look him up. Hugh was born in France somewhere between 1135 and 1140. He went into a priory as a boy, rose through the ranks and was eventually requested by Henry II to go to England as part of Henry avoiding going on crusade as penance for the death of Thomas Becket. It's involved, that's the short version. Hugh was consecrated as Bishop of Lincoln in 1181. He did everything he could to alleviate poverty in his bishopric. He protected the Jews of Lincoln when they were yet again being persecuted. He took in lepers and cared for them himself, which was pretty much unheard of. And he repeatedly challenged Henry whenever he felt it was needed which is pretty brave when you think about Thomas Beckett. When Henry died, Hugh continued this behaviour with Richard I. But none of that is what made me laugh in the library. None of that's funny. That's really admirable. What made me laugh was this. Hugh wanted an impressive relic for Lincoln Cathedral. In 1190, on a visit to the Abbey at Fécamp in France, Hugh asked to see their arm bone of Mary Magdalene in order to venerate it. He then asked to kiss the relic. Now, our modern minds are likely to hear that and go, oh, wow, eh. But that level of piety would have been admired. So the monks obliged. Hugh takes the arm and brings it to his lips. At which point he chops down, breaking off a piece and legging it out of the abbey with it still in his mouth. He then claimed that he had honoured the Magdalene by his actions comparing them to the taking of communion. Talk about cheek, but points for quick thinking. That's what made me laugh. Hugh continued as Bishop of Lincoln until his death by fever in 1200 and was himself canonised in 1220. His own remains became a much bigger draw card than that piece of arm and turned Lincoln into one of the major pilgrim centres of Northern Europe until Henry VIII came along. So that's Hugh. I have a lot more tilling and sewing left to do, but that's boring to watch after a while. So there are end cards on the screen to some more of my videos. And if you've made it this far, put the secret code phrase, what a relic, in the comments. Bye.